You're listening to Snyder & Associates podcast series, a civil engineering, planning, and design firm focused on thinking beyond engineering to improve quality of life within the communities we serve. This episode's hosts are Tim West, Andy Meesman, and Clay Schneckloff. We all have a concern regarding the frequency and intensity of large rain events that seem to be occurring more and more often. We seem to get more and more requests for design assistance and controlling stormwater runoff from a lot of our clients. There are also quite a few changing regulations and increasing flood protection ordinances taking effect across a number of areas throughout the Midwest. We wanna talk a little bit today about what we're doing here at Snyder and Associates to address these stormwater challenges, especially for our park and recreation clients. A lot of park space is located in low-lying areas and close to creek and stream corridors. What are some of the challenges you're encountering in your park and recreation design projects when you're dealing with localized flooding from these waterways? One thing I want to talk about was flood hazard mitigation. The idea is that we want to make sure we reduce the severity of flood damage to our parks and waterways that we have. Reducing this risk to structures and experiencing the flood damage is an effect that it's always oh no, what do we do now kind of thing. So we want to try and get up ahead of that and get some design pulled together before we experience some of these effects. The flood zone shifts are impacting the communities that we live in. We've seen that over the past decade where we're seeing some of these events that are happening more frequent than expected. So we're getting these questions saying, hey, we're experiencing water in this area where we've never seen it before. So when we get these heavy rains, it's important to understand what we're gonna do with this water, how we're gonna be able to handle it, get the infiltration needed, and still mitigate and reduce the risk and flood damage in these areas. There's definitely a sensitivity in terms of how we're designing these localized flooding areas and something that I face pretty much on every project and especially at the master planning level is really balancing the recreational opportunities that people really desire and sometimes it conflicts with the natural setting that's supposed to happen there or the flood zone and preserving space for that and really striking a balance between people wanting to get access to a river for instance but there's definitely some constraints in terms of an area being prone to flooding and where do we find that balance? It's always a challenge as a designer to really satisfy everyone's desires for this public open space that we work on. So Andy and the team, what are some strategies for taking a park and designing to function as both a recreational area and a stormwater management area? We definitely get that opportunity when we start looking at these areas. We're trying to reduce the flood damage. And when we're doing that, we're trying to change and help with the infiltration in these watersheds. How can we provide some storage of that water in our landscape? So by incorporating wetlands, stormwater basins, some terraces, do some channel bank stabilization, some buffer strips to help keep and protect our features that we're trying to incorporate into these public areas. It's important that as landscape architects and what we do a lot at Snyder and Associates is working closely with the municipal engineers, uh, the city staff, the planners to really plan out long term in terms of what they want to do with their recreational area and how to manage stormwater within it. It's a very challenging part of the profession. We're working real closely right now with the village of Cottage Grove on a Miracle League field, working with the municipal engineers on where the water is going and actually updating waterfall intensities based on new code and making sure that works in the long range plan of the parks. It's really all hands in type of design when it comes to trying to design for a larger park system to cater to both recreational desires as well as just the passive stormwater management aspects. Another project that we kind of took that same strategy was down in Knoxville, Iowa, Young's Park. We were dealing with a park that had a whole bunch of small, flat areas that didn't drain well, almost a bunch of little mini basins. One strategy that we took was to increase one low area, collect all the stormwater in one low area, and utilize some of that cut and shaping to create a larger platform which eventually would be the home to a small skate park and large rope climber element. That allowed us to concentrate what was stormwater pockets all over the park into one larger stormwater 
basin area that could be set aside and utilized for stormwater management, then we could free up these other areas a little bit higher and drier so that they could operate for different park programming uses. Yeah, when we get approached about those park site dedications, there's kind of some minimum characteristics that we like to promote for a general park, particularly if it's in a neighborhood and it's some sort of a remnant property. We'd like to see some amount of street frontage to allow for some parking or maintenance vehicle access. It also provides a little bit more of an inviting park area and allows the park to be identified a little more clearly than feeling like it's in the back behind some people's properties. We also look for two to three acres of area that is relatively flat. It depends on the size of the property that's being conveyed, but a lot of times they'll consist of like a stormwater basin or a creek area and you get a lot of side slope or something that's fairly unusable. Kind of the last area that we really recommend when considering new park spaces is having a clear public access way or multiple access ways if you can. It can be off the right of way, but it also needs to feel like it's part of the public. By providing multiple access points, you can promote park use and the equity of park use. It also provides a more safe connection to any given park, particularly when it's in a neighborhood. So it doesn't always feel like you're in somebody's backyard. By having multiple access points, a broader exposure to the public street or the right of way, all those elements provide a, a better feel for the park and help to provide a better park space that the city is going to be more interested in acquiring. It's getting harder and harder to keep construction projects on schedule due to wet times of the year, not having enough construction days when we have these connected rain events. Can you guys give some explanation or experiences on how you've been able to mitigate these schedule impacts and how you like to approach project scheduling in your park projects? Communication with the client, with the parks board, with the city, whoever it needs to be, we want to have that communication up front. Whether it's a new park or just a piece of a park, everyone's excited with getting this new space created and open to the public as fast as they can. So whenever it's the pressure of like, oh, we need to get this park open as soon as we can, you know what happens, weather steps in and causes a delay. And it's not a fun topic to try and step in front of a parks board in front of your shareholder committee and say, guess what? We're delayed three weeks because it rained and we didn't account for it. We want to have those conversations up front and have weather days built into the completion of this project. We want to have that conversation with the owner and the shareholder group first. We want to be up front with our clients. They need to know that it's expected and accounted for. Weather is not going to be perfect for us for this entire project. We know there's going to be some weather delays because of what we're experiencing and have experienced in the past years. One option that we've started to talk about is the completion date. We need to allow for these additional days due to weather, but is there a specific grand opening that needs to be met for this piece of the park or the new park? If there is, then we need to maybe start this project a little bit earlier if we can to make sure we're meeting that specific grand opening date. Is it possible to move that completion date back a little bit to give the contractor a little bit more leeway to be able to make this project happen in the specified time? One thing that we've seen over and over again is a lack of working days in the spring. I think we've almost eliminated the opportunity to get a lot of work done in the spring because we've been a little scared about how wet the weather is and how few drying days we have. It also makes it pretty difficult to protect some of the work when they open up the site to earthwork and then it sits there muddy and has to be drained. Spring seems to be one of the most critical parts of the project and by extending those construction dates out into the fall or even the following year, I think you're right, Clay, we need to make sure we keep that in mind when we set those early schedules. Something that I've learned over many years of designing and administering construction when it's going on is just to spec local and spec simple. That plays into well of other conversations we've had on these podcasts about sustainability and climate change. And the more local you can get for specking products, obviously there's less transit costs and a smaller ecological footprint there. 
you're supporting local businesses and really expecting simple, specifying simple designs, um, easier designs to install obviously makes this whole construction process easier and your designs actually end up looking better. I'm sure you guys can attest to that to the years of experience you've had on site and making sure designs are followed through. Going back to what Clay said about coordination up front, I think that's a big element in terms of making the construction process smoother to avoid delays related to weather. Speaking with our clients, if they can order amenities up front so they have them staged and ready to go is always an important aspect that can really save on time. Thank you for listening to Snyder & Associates podcast series, a civil engineering, planning, and design firm focused on thinking beyond engineering to improve quality of life within the communities we serve. Find content related to this episode on snyder-associates.com.